Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Brown. Uh, I am uh, with the State Bar of Wisconsin, which is the membership organization for all lawyers in the state of Wisconsin. And I'm also uh, the staff coordinator for a small nonprofit that we helped to create called the Wisconsin Access to Justice Commission. So I have an intense interest in uh, ideas that can help improve nonprofits, both for the issues that I work on and for the issues that I care about that you all work on. Uh, so I'm here to introduce our speaker for today, uh, for lunchtime. Hi, Brent. Um, our speaker today is someone who has a passion for helping nonprofits find their way uh, out of ruts that they find themselves in, uh, for helping them move forward as sustainable and vibrant organizations. He's a nonprofit leader who's been in your shoes as a development director and as an executive director. He's a highly sought after consultant and speaker with nearly 10 years of experience as a leader in the nonprofit sector. Uh, on a personal level, I've seen Brent Hafley lead discussions of fundraising and strategic planning with groups of lawyers, and not just any lawyers, but underfunded, skeptical, and cranky public interest lawyers, <laughs> people who argue for a living. Uh, he survived that. And we did too, and we're better off for it. So Brent shares your belief that you are all special, just like your parents told you, but he won't let you use that as an excuse for avoiding the hard decisions that will help you grow. Brent mastered the ins and outs of nonprofit operations while serving as executive director at the Chippewa Valley Free Clinic and as development director at Hope Gospel Mission. Now he shares his expertise as a regular speaker at national, regional, and local conferences on nonprofit leadership and through his consulting practice, New Day, <coughs> excuse me, New Day Nonprofit Solutions. At New Day Nonprofit Solutions, Brent helps nonprofits with a variety of issues, including capital campaigns, general fundraising, strategic planning, nonprofit leadership, board governance, and vibrancy planning. In his consulting work, he's already challenged and empowered over 35 agencies throughout the country, and that list is growing. In his spare time, Brent also teaches courses on capital campaigns and nonprofit marketing at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota. He earned his master's degree in philanthropy and development from St. Mary's University, also in Minnesota. I have a sneaking suspicion that he might be a closet Vikings fan, <laughs> but he can tell you whether or not he is. His bona fides now, uh, he lives in Eau Claire with his wife Jennifer, their son Evan, daughter Rachel, and a new baby who's going to be arriving in November. So if you haven't, uh, just uh, make sure you stop by Brent's booth uh, for New Day Nonprofit. Uh, he's having a drawing for a Kindle Fire X, uh, HDX. So all you need to do is sign up for the uh, blog updates at his booth to be entered to win the Kindle Fire HDX. And uh, he's going to be discussing the topics from today's address over the next six weeks in upcoming blog posts uh, on his website. So check that out at NewDayNonprofit.com. Welcome to Madison, Brent. Thank you very much, Jeff. I appreciate your very kind introduction. And it is great to be at Madison Nonprofit Day. I I uh, first spoke at Madison Nonprofit Day years and years ago when it was a wee little conference like that. And so uh, I'm just so impressed with all the work that Alnisa and all the other volunteers and the team has done to, to make this a great, uh, great event. About a year ago, I had an interesting experience, an experience that kind of changed my philosophy and my perspective on the nonprofit sector. I was at a conference like this in Baltimore. And I was working a booth like I have outside the door. And I had a man come up to me, an executive director, and he came up to me and he says, I need your help, but I'm not sure what I need your help with. <laughs> OK. So I asked him a round of questions. Do you need help with a capital campaign? Nope. Do you need help with? Uh, fundraising. Well, everyone needs help with fundraising, but no, that's not what we need help with. Okay. Do you need help with planning? No. How about leadership? No. 
I was starting to get confused. And so we talked, and we discussed the situation, and by the end of our conversation, I came up with this idea. Now, I don't know how many of you have children or have been in the medical field or have ever heard of this term before, but my wife is a little H league leader, so I know all sorts of things about children and babies and breastfeeding and all sorts of different things. More than most men probably should know. Yeah, anyway. Um, but there's a condition called failure to thrive. And that's when the medical community can't really figure out what's wrong with the infant, but it's just not thriving. And I had the idea that I think this organization has failure to thrive. I wonder what that's about. So, I went back to my office, and I'm from Eau Claire, so I'm not from Madison. I hope that, thank you for welcoming me to Ma back to Madison. Um, and yes, I am a Packers fan. Um, Vikings are not worth spending time on or even considering as a team, in my opinion. So there, does that clarify some things for you? Hopefully it does not offend. We'll, we'll edit that out of the video um, for my Minnesota clients. Um, So I thought about this in my office, about what can we do with this? What does that look like? What should this be? And I came up with this idea. I went up to him, and we'll call him John, because we want to protect the innocent in this situation. They're, they're growing, and we'll call the organization the ABC Nonprofit. Um, and I came up with this idea. I said, John, why don't we do vibrancy planning? He says, that's awesome. I think that's great. What is it? And I said, I don't know. And for whatever reason, he bought it. He flew me out to his city to do vibrancy planning. And I didn't know what it was. He didn't know what it was. Somehow I wrote it up in a contract, and that was that. Today I want to talk to you about vibrancy. And what I had is, is I had an interesting experience, because this client continued to be interesting. Most clients are. And I went and I met with this client, and we went and we, um, he had me stop at his, uh, we, we flew into his city, and I, talk, I stopped into his, his organization. And I was supposed to be there at 8.30, and I was there early. Uh, and he called me and he said, I can't make it, my assistant's supposed to be there, but my assistant can't make it either. So here's the code, why don't you just key in and make yourself happy? <laughs> okay. I've never had that experience of walking through a client's facility without the client. <clears throat> That was bizarre. And this is what I saw. Ugh. This was their conference room. And I walked through the building, and I kind of was like, what's going on in this agency? Then I went and I saw this. Ooh. And I'm thinking to myself, what do I know about this agency? What's going on? He said he didn't have problems. He just needed help. There's something wrong. I'm not sure what that was, was what he said. But he, he, they weren't thriving. They weren't as vibrant as they needed to be. What were we going to do about that? So today what I want to do is I want to talk to you about the concept of vibrancy. Because what this agency was doing, what I ended up finding after I assessed them, as I looked, is I found out a number of things. First of all, they were redlining as an organization. Now, I don't know um, how many of you know lots about cars, but there's the speedometer in the, begin in, uh, in the front, and then either to the left or to the right, depending on the automaker, is something called a tachometer. And the tachometer measures the RPMs, the revolutions per minute, that the engine's running. How fast is the hamster going in the hamster wheel? Okay? And a good car should be running somewhere between 2,000 RPM and maybe 4,000 RPM. That's when it's in its sweet spot. But... That car can run into the seven and eight thousands like this. But if you run that car in the seven or eight thousands for too long, you're going to burn out that engine. That's what was happening at this agency. They were going from budget to budget uh, and, and didn't have a lot of money. They were fighting like crazy to keep their volunteers. They had staff engagement issues. They had all sorts of problems. They were living in crisis reactive mode. And so we needed to come up with a vibrancy plan. We needed to think of something different than crisis reactive mode, and this concept of vibrancy kind of came up in my mind. 
So over the next six, uh, about three, four months, we started working on a vibrancy plan, and they're not there yet. I will tell you that. They have a lot of work to go. This is, they, did not, they did not get there in three months, and they're not going to be done in three months. It's going to be a year, multi-year process to get out of this situation. But it started to make me think, because I've seen other nonprofits like this. I've seen other agencies that operate like this. So here's my question for you today. Are you hoping or are you planning for vibrancy? Now, in my presentation today, I want to talk to you about four <coughs> flaws that I see in nonprofit thinking. These things are pervasive in our nonprofit culture, and I think they're problems. I want to talk to you about being nice. Why would that be a problem? We'll find out. I want to talk about thrifty. This is one of the hallmark values that we have is our thriftiness. Aren't we thrifty? I want to talk about working hard. Working hard, especially in the Midwest, is something we do well. But it's a problem. And I want to talk to you about being busy. Oh my goodness, we're so busy. We're busy, busy, busy. Wow, are we a busy organization. We're going to talk about that because there's some issues. Now, for some of you, I may push the limit a little bit. Others may be cheering me on saying, yes, yeah, say more. Either way, no matter where you fall, my hope is that this presentation makes you think a little bit harder about the way that you process your nonprofit and what you're doing in your agency. So let's start. Let's talk about the problem of being nice. I'm going to go back to that ABC nonprofit that I worked at. And they had an employee who I will call Carl. Carl was a stoic Norwegian man, someone that Garrison Keillor would be proud of. Okay? And he was an individual who, this, was, uh, this agency did a number of things. They were a social service agency that kind of just did a little bit of everything. And they had a food bank. And he was the food bank manager. And if any of you know anything about food banks, I know that there's a representative from Second Harvest here, but if any of you know anything about food banks, um, they know a fair bit about the USDA, the Univer United States Department of Agriculture, and how they have a program to provide food. But that program comes with some strings attached. And those strings involve electronic processing and management and a number of things. Carl was not only computer illiterate, Carl was unwilling to work with the computer. And he has been in the position for a long time. And so the agency looked at this man, and they, they talked to him, and they said, you know, Carl, we need to do this. Ah, I don't want to do that. And so what they did is they, they, they at some point just gave up with Carl, and they started doing something um, which I just don't think is, is, is comfortable, but they started tiptoeing around him. They'd tiptoe around him and they'd fill out this report. And then after that, you know, then the next month comes and they'd tiptoe around him and they'd fill out the USDA report because they need to get the money, don't they? But whose job was that? That was Carl's. Who was not doing Carl's job? Carl. So what they were doing as an agency is mistaking being nice with being kind. There's a difference. If any of you have read Patrick Lencioni or have read the work of Andy Stanley, both talk about this dichotomy of nice and kind. And nice is being pleasant to your face. It's smiling. Oh, how are you? And thinking to yourself, I really don't like you, but I'm going to smile and I'm going to shake your hand. That's nice. That's Midwestern nice. We have a problem with that in this area. <laughs> Don't we? Kind is having the, the chutzpah, having the love in your heart to be honest with people. And to say, Carl, I don't think we got a fit here. I think we either need to move you to a different position or we need to help you find an agency that will fit better your skills and your abilities and your interests. Because what they were doing as an agency is sacrificing their mission to be nice. They were reducing their effectiveness as an organization. Vibrant organizations don't do that. And, and so I want you to think for a minute about the types of agencies that you have worked with in your, or types of volunteers, types of ex staff members, this type of board members that you have at your agency. How many of them are incompetent? Do you have an incompetent one? Or worse yet, do you have the toxic employee? 
or the toxic volunteer. Someone who is incredibly talented. The toxic ones are always really talented. You gotta have, you can't live without them. But you can't live with them either. Now, when I was executive director of the free clinic at, in Eau Claire, and I actually walked this walk, I don't just preach this stuff, I walked this walk, I had a policy at our clinic that we were not going to, now I worked with doctors. Now, I did work with lawyers, and that was a challenging group of people to work with. But I also have worked with physicians. And I made it very clear that I was not going to widen the doors to accommodate a physician's ego into the building. And we turned down some of the most prominent physicians who wanted to work at our clinic because it ruined the culture, even though, wow, the great doctor whoever is coming to help. Big deal, everyone hates them. <laughs> and then I lose half my volunteer force because they don't like working with that jerk. So who do you have in your agency that needs to change? Are you sacrificing your mission to be nice? Is it time to start being kind and thinking about the mission first? The next issue is being thrifty. Now, thrifty is something we celebrate, we honor, we love. We saved this money. Let me tell you a quick story. When I started at the Chippewa Valley Free Clinic, they hired me because I had successfully run a capital campaign at Hope Gospel Mission. And so they thought, ooh, we want you to run a capital campaign at our place. Because we need more space. We need more space. We need more space. So I walked through their facility and I did an assessment. And that's one of the things that I do is I just like, I study, I kind of observe, I look around, I see what's going on. And I looked at what was happening there. And I saw very much similar to the ABC nonprofit. In the lab, there was ceiling or floor to ceiling shelving 10 feet wide. And I was looking at the items that were on that shelving unit. And so I measured and I you know, calculated and I th th looked at things and I realized there is 22 inches of shelf space dedicated to cotton tip applicators. That's the medical term for Q-tips, okay? 22 inches of space, shelf space. Now that may not be important to you, but I went to my clinic manager and I asked her, I said, Susan, how many Q-tips do we use in a year? She gave me a number, I did the calculation. We had a 26 year supply of Q-tips. <laughs> I'm serious. Now how much do you think a box of 1,000, one year supply, how much do you think a box of 1,000 Q-tips costs a free medical clinic? $5. We multiplied the Q-tips by alcohol swabs, syringes, gauze. We didn't even do bandaging and wounds, but we had lots of gauze, just in case. You never have enough gauze, seriously. It was so bad that after we moved all that stuff out of the way, we didn't even need the shelf, shelving unit. We got rid of the shelving unit and we had room to move in our lab instead of having to go in the lab like this. We had a little bit of room. Now think about your nonprofit. Are you the nonprofit that is saving every penny because who knows if the world runs out of Q-tips? Or the cost of Q-tips skyrockets and suddenly it's like six dollars for a thousand. And so we have to hold on to every Q-tip. We have to hold on to every can of beans. We have to hold on to every whatever it happens to be. Are you the nonprofit that uh, is in, unwilling to invest in computers? And so your computers are the ones with the crank on the side. <laughs> you know, some of you know you have those machines right now. Are you the agency that pays your employees dirt wages and does not provide a living wage or an honorable wage to your agency? That's not, that, that's not vibrant. That's being thrifty. But there's a better way. And I'd like to propose that your agency, vibrant organizations are not thrifty, they're good stewards. 
They think not only about saving money, but they also think about investing it. I have learned, I've been, in, I've been in my practice for six years, so I've gone to the dark side from being a nonprofit leader to now I work with nonprofits, but for profit, hopefully, most of the time. <laughs> and in that business realm, I have to make a profit. I have to run uh, my business in a certain way, but I have learned how valuable it is to make an investment and invest in what you're doing, invest in the way that you're working. To invest in good fundraising principles, to invest in good computers. Because you know, not only is that slow computer wasting your staff's time, it's making them angry, because it's disrespectful. It says, you're worth less than a $500 new computer. Or even better yet, one of those. A Mac. Sorry, I, I, I'm a Mac guy. But, but, it, but, it, but it makes, it's a values judgment. If you are invest, you don't invest in the chairs, and the chairs that you have, you know, back pains, and, 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 and fatigue, and other types of things, having ergonomic things, even just valuing your employees, that's so critical. That's being a steward. Vibrant organizations invest in their organization, or in, in, in their agency. And so I would encourage you to think about, are you sacrificing your effectiveness to be thrifty? Or is it time for thriftiness to go away and it's time to start thinking like a steward? Now that does not mean being, you know, spending like crazy. But it means thinking about investing money and investing resources and investing in your people, investing in your systems so that you're doing everything in a vibrant way, in a way that's, that's powerful, that is engaging, in a way that builds long term. Because the truth is, we've got a mission, whether you're an art center or a food bank, whether you work with the, uh, with the poor or with children or with the elderly, whether you're saving the environment, it doesn't matter. We have missions that are really critical. Whether you're fighting for the rights of people that um, are struggling uh, with access to justice, we have important missions. We need to be a vibrant agency. So now the next one is kind of interesting as well. It's called working hard. And I think there's a problem with working hard. And I want to talk about that a little bit. So I started at, the Hope, at Hope Gospel Mission. And when I was there, I had a service learning student. How many of you have worked with service learning students before? There you go. Now, about 75% of service learning students, in my opinion, are unmotivated and disinterested and frustrating to work with. But there's 25% that are like, wow. And Elizabeth Meyer was one of those. And so she worked for me 30 hours. She was voluntold, because that's what service learning is all about, being voluntold. You will volunteer. Um, <laughs> but she embraced that opportunity. She walked into that willingly. And she did a fabulous job. And by hour about 27, 28, 29, I started to figure out, oh no, she's leaving. That's not good. So I scrambled, and I had money in my budget to hire an intern. So I hired her. And I kept her for two years. I, by the way, I really like two-year internships instead of six-month ones, because you can train them in the first six months and then get a profit off of that for 18 months. Really good way. So hire sophomores. Um, <laughs> but then, doggone it, she had to graduate on me. And I knew she was going to graduate, she was going to leave me. And I was like, Elizabeth, you're too valuable to lose. So I scrambled again, and I went to the board, and I asked for a full-time position. And the board su surprised me, and they granted it to me. So I hired her as a full-time employee. Now, we had a culture as an organization of working hard. And this was before I knew, to, knew better. But we had a culture of working hard. And I was a development director at that time, and I thought I knew everything. I didn't. I still don't. But, you know. Um, there's things I got to learn. I think we all do. As soon as we stop learning, I think we start dying. But we had a culture of coming in at maybe 7.30 in the morning, working till 6.30, 7 o'clock at night. And then, just to finish up things, we'd come in on Saturdays and work a little bit too. 50, 60, 70 hour weeks were celebrated in our organization. And I know from all the organizations I've worked with that they're celebrated in many of yours as well. 
And so Elizabeth went in my office one day and she says, Brent, I want to go home at four. And? No, that's it. I want to go home at four every day. I don't understand. <laughs> Do you want to come in earlier? Nope. Are you going to take a shorter lunch? No. Oh, you're going to come in extra on Saturdays? No. She looked at me with, with the bravado that was uncharacteristic of a very shy young lady. 22-year-old young lady, she looked at me and she said, if God can't use my 40 hours, how can he use my 60? Now, I don't know where you fall in faith. That's not the point. The point is, she recognized we were working too hard. We were not doing a good job. So, we, so I made her a deal. I said, you can go home at 4 if you take me with you. And I did not ask my boss. And so what we did is uh, every day, 3 o'clock comes around, Brent, 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 are you ready? Are you going to be ready to leave at 4? Is there anything I can do to help you? And we would leave at 4. And I will tell you, we got more done leaving at 4 o'clock than we ever did leaving at 6.30. Far more. We were more motivated because we knew, oh, wow, we can actually have a life. We can work to live instead of live to work. That was a big deal. Now, my story continues, though, because when I started that free clinic job, I thought I was on top of the world. I was executive director. I was 26 years old. I was looking at this saying, this is fabulous. I, I, this, is, this is awesome. I'm ready to go. And yet, I had not internalized this whole working hard thing yet and the problems that it created. I was working like crazy, and my body was falling apart. And so I got a nasty gram one day from my doctor after a physical. You know, He actually had the guts to, to say this. And, and, and he, he spoke to me, and he says, you are overweight. Your labs are all a mess. You are pre-diabetic you have what's called dysmetabolic syndrome. All of your labs are messed up. You are a classic case. You're going to stroke out at 45 if a heart attack doesn't hit you before that. You need to change, and you need to change now. My body was literally falling apart. But I was all doing it. I was sacrificing myself for the mission. Are you doing the same thing? Because that's not vibrant. That's not what vibrant organizations do. That's not what vibrant people do. So I had to learn. I had to start working smart. I had to start taking good care of myself, which meant eating well, exercising. I know, I said the exercise word. Ooh. It means giving myself enough self-respect that I'm going to go home at the end of the day and say, enough is enough. I know my mission is important, but so am I. And taking good care of myself, because how can you take care of all of your clients if you're not taking care of yourself? if you're not cared for yourself. So I want to encourage you, and I know this gets personal, but I want to encourage you to think deeply about how you're taking care of yourself and how you're taking care of your employees. Because you're too important. And your work is too important. And imagine what our society would look like if the nonprofit leaders in our society were vibrant. If we had the physical abilities, if we had the energy, if we had the vibrancy in ourselves, if we embodied the vibrancy, and then we went out to tackle our nonprofits and we started working smart instead of working hard, not sacrificing ourselves to work hard. The last one that I have that I want to share today is about being busy. Busy, 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 busy. Oh my goodness, are we busy. And donors love busy. Don't they love busy? They want to know that you're busy. And you're doing lots of things. And this ABC organization, boy, were they busy. They did a little bit of this. They had a food bank. They had 
um, driver's license programs, they had an um, education program and a clinic, and they had this and they had that. And they, they did this all for a $500,000 budget. And they said, look at all that we're doing with this, this budget. Look at all busy we are. Look at all that we're doing. And I'm thinking, look at all that you're doing with that budget. Oh, that's not sustainable. That's not vibrant. They were busy. So I have a story. I want to share a metaphor quick. Earlier this year, I had a sales trip. And I took what I called my Great Pacific Northwest tour. I don't know why, but for some freaky reason, I have lots of clients in the Pacific Northwest. I've got five clients in Washington State, two in Idaho, and I'm working on one. I'll be in Montana next week. It's bizarre. Like, what about Wisconsin? So, but <laughs> now I have them here too. But the question that I, I, I was out there, and I had a plan. I was going to go from Seattle to Portland, Portland to Walla Walla, Walla Walla to Lewiston, Idaho, Lewiston, Idaho, over the Snoqualmie Pass, back to Seattle. And as I was thinking about this trip and planning it, I was thinking, what kind of car should I drive? And typically, if I can find a Prius or a hybrid that is at a decent rate, I will rent a Prius. It's just within, consistent with my values. But I was looking ahead at the map, and I saw Snoqualmie Pass. And I knew I was going through the Cascades in February. A Prius was not going to do it, folks. That wasn't going to work. So I chose to get an all-wheel drive vehicle. I ended up getting a Toyota Venza, which I found out is not, I'm not the demographic for a Toyota Venza. But nonetheless, that's what I got. And so um, I had a four-wheel drive vehicle with the extra size wheels, and it was a very comfortable ride, but it did not get the gas mileage of the Prius. I'll promise you that, especially on a 1,000-mile thousand, thousand trip. But Snoqualmie Pass, it snows 24 hours a day, almost. And I'm not kidding. They get, they get feet and feet and feet of snow in Snoqualmie Pass. And they have plows that literally plow up, and then they plow down, and then they plow up, and then they plow down all day long to keep the interstate free. And I drove through there, and I made it. And I'm sure glad I got that Prius. Now, or I, sorry, I'm sure glad I got that Venza. There you go. I'm glad. There you go. I'm sure glad I got that Venza, that four-wheel drive. Now, here's the point. Too many nonprofits have either rearview mirror thinking, where they're looking back at, well, what were the financials last month? Let's spend three quarters of our board meeting on the financials for last month. Or they have headlight thinking. They look just far enough away to be reactive. But they're not thinking in that map sense. They're not thinking cyclically in the way. And one of the things that I know is that a better way to look at that, a vibrant way, is to be proactive, to look beyond the headlights and look at the map. Now, a lot of you may think of the map as being planning and strategic planning. I think it's more than that. I think it's positioning your organization so that you can be a strong organization long term. And not just thinking about your three year plan. There's more to it than a strategic plan. Strategic plan gets lots of, you know, ooh, it's very exciting, kind of. And there are times when strategic planning is really important. But there are other things that I think need to be thought of as well as you look at your organization. Now, just like our years have seasons, winter, spring, summer, fall, wash, rinse, and repeat. I think nonprofits do as well. And I call that uh, cycle the growth cycle. And here's the cycle that I think most vibrant nonprofits go through. Now, the crisis reactive nonprofits, they don't do that. But vibrant nonprofits go through the same cycle, just like we go through seasons. They start with planning. They think about where do they want to be when they grow up as an organization. And then they prepare for it. So just like a marathon runner, someone saying, I want to run a marathon today, they think ahead and they look to that and they say, OK, I'm going to get ready. I'm going to start training. A lot of nonprofits, they create their plan and they say, We're going to run the, I have a plan to run a marathon and I'm going to start tomorrow with the marathon. Does not work that way. Too many of my clients are calling me with a capital campaign 
saying, we want to run a capital campaign. And I'm like, how long did you know this was going to be happening? And they call me at the last minute when it's, we got to fix the plane in the midair. The next step is to grow. Sometimes growth means a capital campaign. Sometimes growth means a new building. Sometimes growth just means raising the bar and becoming, getting a new standard. It may mean developing your major donor program. It may mean building your sustainability. I don't know what that means for you. But there's a growth phase. And then after the growth phase, there's a sustainability phase where you've got to keep it going. And you have gradual growth instead of big growth. But then again, there's that wash, rinse, and repeat. Where when you're in the sustained phase, you need to think about the next growth phase and say, is our database ready? Are our donors ready? Have we been doing the right things to prepare our organization for growth? Because you know what? Someday your population might grow. <coughs> Someday your funding may fall apart and you need, you need other types of funding. Someday something else will change. And that, anticipating those things and thinking ahead, even if you don't need a campaign, thinking ahead to either challenging times or, or great opportunities and just being ready for those scenarios is vibrant. Now, I would encourage you to think about is your agency proactive or is it just busy? Do you take time to think ahead, to actually look at the map instead of just out the headlights? Where are you at with that? Are you sacrificing your efficacy, your impact, by being busy instead of being focused and being proactive. Now, I told you before the ABC nonprofit is still in process and they're going to be working for a while. They got a, they got a long road to go. But one of my first clients was the Fort Wayne Rescue Mission in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And literally they had hired me to help them figure out how to get the women's shelter and the men's shelter staff to get along. Perhaps you have a staff like that or a department or divisions. They actually had a women's division and a men's division and amazingly the divisions were divided. I think there's power in words. Anyway, it was a deeply wounded organization. They were definitely in crisis reactive mode. They were nice. They were thrifty. They were busy. And they worked hard, but they were not thinking vibrantly. And so we, over the last five years, have been working together. And we have taken steps, and this is not about Brent. This is about this agency that said, this is the bar that we want to set. This is the goal. We want to be the best homeless shelter in the country. Now, whether they're going to do that or not, I don't know. Isn't that a nice goal? Isn't some, that something that's worth achieving or trying to aspire to? And they've been fighting for it for five years. They have an amazing leadership team. They, they, they stopped being nice and started being kind. Incredible leadership team. They've started to pay their staff livable wages. Because you know what? They help the homeless. They help the poor. Why should their staff be poor? Shouldn't their staff be taken care of? They invest in their organization. And now they're in a position where they are thinking about doing a $13 million project next year. They are thinking about growing as an organization. And five years ago, they had a tough time getting $4 million. In fact, they only got two of the four, and they instead inherited $2 million of debt. That was not my campaign, by the way. <laughs> they are a vibrant organization. So as I close and as, as we end and think about vibrancy, I want to ask you, instead of hoping for vibrancy, are you planning for it? Are you thinking actively about how to achieve that and moving in that direction? Because as a, as a vibrant organization, it's time to start being kind. It's starting, time to start stewarding your resources wisely. It's time to start working smart instead of hard. And it's time to start thinking proactively. Thank you very, very much, and God bless you. <laughs>